Uh, welcome to my session. I'm going to talk uh, about Chef and M Collective and how you can uh, use those tools um, to build your, your own clouds and to control um, a lot of infrastructure. Uh, first, a couple of words about myself. Uh, I work in Berlin. Um, I do a lot of infrastructure um, stuff, a lot of um, uh, work around deployment. And uh, that's uh, how, how I got uh, drawn into my uh, um, a project uh, called Scalarium, which is um, and, and configuration management tool for controlling clouds in, on EC2. And the talk will be part of lessons learned um, on, building, on building such tool and um, the lessons that we, that we took um, while working on a big infrastructure project uh, for a client with um, like 1,000 servers. Um, I mean, what all of those have in common is that, that um, we're talking about cloud computing, controlling cloud, so, so what is it? Um, in my context, it's um, basically infrastructure as a service. So mostly Amazon EC2, but uh, for a lot of people it also means in-house capacity like uh, VMware, uh, Eucalyptus, and stuff like that. So servers um, via API. Um, the problem is if, if you um, have the, um, use one of those, what you, what you end up is you get a wild mix of servers. You, you, you um, can boot a, a SUSE um, Linux um, server, you can uh, boot, uh, boot an Ubuntu server, um, but it's basically uh, just plain infrastructure. There is no coordination, there is no, no real system. And what you really want to have is some kind of a, um, a system that I can deploy my app to. I want a structured system um, that is fully configured where uh, the uh, individual components know where the other components are and what they're doing um, and where you have a lot of automatically configuration and, and so on. So what you, what you really need on top of, of those plain APIs is automation. Automation for configuration, for healing, for scaling, for deployment. And, um, and this is the, the, the thing that I'm going to talk about. Um, of course there are commercial um, automation solutions like Engineard, um, Scalarum that I mentioned, RightScale, they, they do this um, uh, mainly on, on Amazon EC2. Um, but what I'm going to, to talk about is how you, could you build this um, for yourself, um, which, I, which I don't recommend unless you have a very good reason to do yourself. Yeah? Um, but there, there could be reasons. So for example, one of our clients, they had 1,000 machines in-house that they already used to deploy a very large, um, a large real estate application with millions of users, and they had 1,000 machines. And you cannot just like say, oh, let's go completely to Amazon and just write off those 1,000 machines where we have um, like, 10 full-time admins working on those. Uh, we have like very clear security guidelines and so on. Um, another reason, as I said, uh, governance, security uh, policies. Uh, if you're working for the uh, for the government, if you um, have very sensitive data, it's very hard to give those uh, away. And um, mostly flexibility. If the the commercial solutions don't fit exactly your need, or mostly it's it's the the, the other way around that you are so inflexible to come up with a good solution. That's, uh, in, in this case, what the big uh, enterprise company had to, um, like they were convinced they had to build their own because nobody covers our uh, requirements, of course. Yeah. Um, so what do we need if, if we want to build a system that automates infrastructure with thousands of machines? What are the, the basic ingredients? And um, those are like the, the core components that I want to focus on. Um, what you do is you, you, of course, you have all your thousands of machines that you, that you need to configure in individual classes, individual projects, and uh, you want to somehow control them. Controlling means you want to deploy your software, you want to start new service, you want to replace failing systems. And uh, mainly there, there are three components that, that you need. The first is, of course, this command and, and control infrastructure um, that, that has all the logic, how the instance should be used, um, what kind of configuration you want to have um, and that executes the, the commands where you go to in order to, to deploy something. Um, then you have the, the communication channel and then you have the, in, on the individual host the, the actual configuration. How do I turn a, a, a fresh uh, booted instance into my Rails application server, into my Proskus database? Uh, so those are the, 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 three, the three components you have to in, implement. Um, as I said, the first one is probably the one where you, um, that is mostly individual to your, to your um, constraints, that is um, very dependent on your processes, on your protocols, and so on. So the main idea is you talk, th this component actually talks to the, 
to the um, infrastructure APIs. So in the case of Amazon, talks to EC2 to start servers. And it has um, all the, it handles all the interaction with the user. So either via an API, via the command line interface, or uh, via the web um, UI. And um, it stores the configuration, as I said, what do you want to do on, on, this mach on the machines? Um, I'm going to, to show you um, an implementation based on, on Fork, which we use to um, do all the, the interaction with Amazon, um, a simple rates um, web app and a call to be repository, um, but more on that later. Um, the communication channel is, um, in theory, very simple. It should just relay the messages, relay what you want to do to the individual machines. Um, but the problem is you want to do, build it in a, in a scalable, redundant way. You have thousands of machines, um, so um, you, need, you need a scalable solution. Just logging in via, via SSH um, doesn't work because it doesn't scale um, across multiple machines. If um, It doesn't scale across data centers. Um, it, it, you need some kind of an asynchronous, um, scalable solution. And what I'm going to talk about is um, how you could do this with M Collective, which is a tool that I think very few heard about. Who have already heard about M Collective? Okay, okay, a couple. Um, the host configuration is probably the, the most obvious stuff. Um, um, it's the how do you, do you actually turn the machine and how do you actually um, execute the local commands. Um, so mostly this will be Chef, I guess. Pretty much everybody already heard about Chef, right? Who has, who has actually experience uh, with, with working with Chef? Okay. Um, because I have, I have a part where I do an introduction to, to Chef, but um, depending on the time, it could be that, that I have to, to make it really short. Um, so, so those are the, the three components that you need. Um, and let's start at the bottom if, if we're going to talk about those. Um, so the, the host configuration, yeah? As I said, uh, Chef. Chef is um, a, a Ruby DSL to describe how you want your server to look like. And then Chef does the magic of, of turning it into the machine that you desire. And the great thing is that it's, it's, a Ruby, it's implemented in Ruby and the configuration is also Ruby. So it's a Ruby DSL. It's very easy to extend, very easy to look at, if, especially if you're a Ruby developer. Uh, but also um, we've seen Java, Perl, um, PHP guys using it to, uh, to build their machines because it's um, very, very high level and very easy to read. Um, yes, the, the basic idea is I have a blank Linux machine, then um, I have um, my, my chef executable that takes um, cookbooks, cookbooks are in chef, um, the, the general definition, how could a server look like? How you, do you achieve installing Apache? What are the necessary steps? What is like the, um, what are the recipes in chef terminology? What do we have to do in order to, um, to achieve this? So the, your cookbooks are um, your complete repository of possible configurations. And then you have the configuration file that just um, tells it, okay, for this specific machi machine, I pick this script and this script and this script, and I have those four configuration values. And then um, Chef goes and changes your machine to look exactly like you specified uh, in an operating system independent way, which is very, very great about it, because you can have uh, Linux machines, you can have uh, Open Solaris machines, you can have uh, BSD machines, um, pretty much every flavor of, of Linux, and Chef will do the right thing. It will choose the correct package manager, it will, it will know how to, to read and, 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 and create files depending on the operating system. And uh, at the end, you hopefully have a, a, a machine that looks exactly like you specified. It has Rails installed with your specific version of Ruby, um, your gems, and so on. Um, if you look at Chef, there are two ways how you can run um, Chef in a, in a, in a big um, scenario. So the first one is um, if you pop up the Chef documentation at the website and you read about it, you read Chef server everywhere. And Chef server is, is probably the way Chef is intended to run. So the idea is uh, it's a client server architecture. I have the Chef server on, one, on, on the one hand, which stores all my cookbooks, all my, my global configuration, and I just have to, to upload it and, and change it there. And then I have um, maybe hundreds of, of nodes that periodically connect to the server and uh, download the configuration and apply the, apply the configuration if it changed. Now, the good thing is you don't have to maintain the configuration um, on individual machines, but it has a couple of drawbacks um, that I will talk about in a minute. And, and the, the other way how you can run Chef is focusing on, on the, on the um, single server view. It's called Chef Solo. Um, which basically means you, you push the configuration down to the machine and you just keep the part um, that does the actual bootstrapping, that uh, does the actual uh, um, logic of transforming a machine into what you want to, um, it to look like. 
And uh, those are the, the two possible ways how you can run it. And um, I think that that you should focus on this on this uh, way if you if you're running an architecture like this um, for a couple of reasons. So uh, for once, Chef Server is very complex compared to Chef Solo. So everybody who, who like started to look into Chef uh, has to know about RabbitMQ, has to know about CouchDB. Um, it used to be that you have to use Stomp and so on. So it's very complex. You had uh, at the beginning they used um, they used OpenID for authentication. So it's it's a very complex piece of software. And uh, what you want to achieve is pretty simple. It's just push configuration. Um, the problem is that for all this complexity, you, you don't gain, gain a lot. Yeah? So you, they don't have concept, a concept of different environments or stages. So um, it's, the new version of Chef is going to get at least a different, uh, um, different environment. So you can say, in production, I choose this configuration var variable and staging another one. But it's very hard to, um, to scale this approach if you have 1,000 machines. 10 projects, and each project has like staging, production, tests, and QA. Um, because every, you have only one global repository of, of, um, of cookbooks, so everybody is going to step on each other's toes. Um, the other problem is that there are no lifecycle events. There's only one global chef run. And you cannot, you cannot really force it, you can only like wait until the client connects and then applies the configuration. And um, it doesn't work really nicely with deployment, for example. Um, if I want to deploy a new version, I want to do it now. I don't want to wait like half an hour until every client connects and uh, applies the configuration. And while doing so, also checks if Apache is installed. But I ju just wanted to like deploy the, the new version of my code. Um, so, so the Chef itself, or Chef Server at least, is, is more aimed at I'm pushing out configuration changes. But if you want to handle um, like a com complete life cycle of a server, including deployment, it's uh, probably not the right choice, at, at least for now. So um, what we ended up choosing uh, twice, um, for like first for Scalarum and then for the big client project, um, is an approach where we use Chef Solo and push the configuration via, um, so either via Nanite or in this case uh, via M Collective, which I'm going to talk uh, about shortly. So um, the idea is that I use my communication channel to just push the correct config files to push the correct um, configuration and cookbooks uh, down to the machines and just let um, let Chef execute it and, and do what it's uh, going what it um, can do best is apply transformations in order to make my machine look like it should be. Um, so yeah, because of the time, I'm not going to talk too much about Chef. I just like going to give you a brief um, intro, probably for those who don't know how Chef roughly works. Um, so the main idea is that you have cookbooks for the different um, for the different things that you want to uh, uh, achieve. So in this case, I have a memcached cookbook that um, I use in order to control memcached. I don't want to install it, start it, stop it, and, and whatever. And the, the um, general workflow is I have attribute files. So I have a folder where I put attributes files, which are roughly like variables that I can extract or, or saying defaults. Then I have the actual recipes. So the recipes are the part that actually has the logic of how do I install memcached. And um, I have templates, which I used in order to create files on the system. And, um, and, and like all chef recipes, uh, all chef cookbooks have this basic structure. There, are a couple of, uh, uh, there could be a couple of other things like files and, and metadata and so on, but this is the core of chef. I have a, I have a cookbook that consists of attributes, recipes, and templates. Um, yeah, so an attribute file just declares defaults. So in this case, we declare some, some defaults like what should the user um, of memcache um, uh, be, what is the, the port where I want it to listen, and what should be, uh, or how much memory do I want to, uh, it to have. Um, so th this way you just ext extract variables so you don't have to use um, the same value everywhere in your recipes. And um, by doing so, you can nicely also override it. So attributes have um, a way of overriding them, which I'm not going to talk about too much, but um, you, can, you can override them, which is, which is great for having defaults and then have the user decide on different values. Um, if we look at the recipe, so this is the, the, the actual gist of Chef. In this case, we're defining a service. So we're telling Chef, the, there is a service on your system, or maybe it should be, but I can control this entity called memcached, and I define how do I start it, how do I stop it, and uh, what do I want to do with it. In this case, I want to do nothing, I'm just defining it, so I can reuse it later. And so this is the service, so I have multiple um, recipes. In this case, this is a service one, and then we have the install one, which includes the service one. 
because I don't have to redeclare the service everywhere. And then I'm, I'm actually installing a memcached. So I'm calling out to the, to the package um, resource in Chef, so the, like the, it's a Ruby method that, that installs a package for me. Um, and so I'm installing two packages, and then I'm creating a template. So I, I create a file in the file system with, um, dynamically with the input that I have. And, and the template is just, a, is just an ERB template, which probably most of you are familiar with. And then the, a ninth addition is the notifies on the bottom, which tells Chef if this template changed while you um, created, or if the version you created is different than the one of the file system, fire this event. So in this case, we are restarting memcached if the configuration file changes. So um, if like I, I install the system once, and a month later I change, um, for example, the memory value, and I rerun this, oh, sorry, I rerun this Chef recipe, it will restart memcached only by changing the, the config file. So it's uh, it's a very uh, a nice twist in order to, to be able to declare dependencies, but not like being restarting services all the time if nothing changed. And the last thing that, uh, that is missing is a template. Pretty simple, just a very simple ERB template um, where I'm accessing the, the default values. So in this case, I'm accessing the memory and the port and the user definition. Very simple. Um, so how do I run it if I have those uh, lying on my file system? I first I have to have a configuration file. So this is um, just a plain JSON file that um, the, the most important part is the, is the run list part that tells Chef what do I want to execute. In this case, I want to execute uh, the memcached install recipe and I want to access um, another recipe that we haven't um, seen. Um, but the, the nice thing is I can override um, the memory value as you see. So it's very easy to, to have defaults and then in your JSON file um, override them. And once I have this JSON file, I can just call out to Chef Solo, which is um, the, the part that takes a config file, takes the uh, cookbooks, changes your system. And this is how we call it via M, M, M Collective. So we have just Chef Solo installed on the machines, and we push new configuration values down and call Chef to, in order to execute it. Um, you can do a lot more with Chef than, than just installing packages and, and, and uh, starting services. So you can create users, you can create routes, you can create files, directories, delete them, execute arbitrary calls. So Chef is, has a lot to offer. Um, but I hope that, that you got, you got the just how Chef works. Um, probably the, the important question is, how do we do deployment with Chef? Um, there are two ways. One is you can use the Chef deploy recipe, which is also a resource where you can specify, please check out the code from here and put it there and then maybe, maybe fire a callback which uh, works nicely for, for like source-dependent uh, deployments like a typical Rails um, process where you check out code, touch temp restart uh, on, on Passenger and restart it. And it's, it's compatible with the, Capistrano, um, with the Capistrano way of deploying, so it has the same file system structure, so it's, um, you can like deploy via Capistrano once you've set it up with it. And the other way is to have just a, an arbitrary script because Chef, we can, everything that you can script, you can do with Chef. It just has like nicer capabilities to express yourself. So you can call, uh, um, uh, you can like download a var file from somewhere. You can um, like do a code checkout, then do a configure, make, make, install. So um, the only thing is you have to to write this those steps yourself. But you can do pretty much everything with Chef, and it's then nicely wrapped in in error handling and notifications and so on. Um, yeah, this is an example. Maybe probably not important uh, too much how how a deploy resource looks like. Um, yeah, so this is the component. How do we actually change the local system? We use Chef for it. So how do, then the, the next question is, how do, I, how, how do I propagate the messages to the instance? How does uh, um, a Rails application server know that it has to deploy now? And we do this um, via M Collective. M Collective is, um, if you look at the website, it says uh, it's, a, it's a framework to build server orchestration or uh, parallel job execution systems. So it's, it's designed to propagate messages reliably across um, probably thousands of machines and allows you, and allows you then to, to implement the actual logic of the orchestration. So it's just a, a means of communication. Um, it, it works basically by using ActiveMQ as a, as, a, um, as a broker, as a message broker. And the idea is that you have agents running on your systems that you want to control. And then you can um, talk to, the, to those either via um, the, the, the Ruby API, so as there's a Ruby gem to do it, or there is a, a small um, command line interface where you can do pretty much the same thing. So, and, um, and the idea is that you just call agents on remote systems. And those agents have to be implemented by you and could do whatever, whatever you want to. 
So how does it work? Um, the general idea is, first you, you, you have your client and you ask the broker, um, I want to call a, um, like all agents that have a certain condition. I, I, I want to know, I want to like call a chef on all of those. So what, um, what uh, M Collective does, it, at first it discovers who is online, yeah? who is listening to, to those messages. Because you, you, it could be that, that a couple of machines um, just shut down or, or um, crashed, or you've booted up a couple of new ones. So first, it, it has a small discovery phase where it, where it finds agents that um, respond to your message. And uh, then you can call those, those actions, and uh, M-Collective will then return the, um, the individual results to you. So you can inspect and see, oh, the call failed on this instance, but it succeeded in those 10. And uh, by using, by using um, ActiveMQ, it's a very, very scalable and, and fault tunnel way and asynchronously. And, it's, and it scales ni nicely over thousands of machines because um, you, you're not like waiting for the individual responses. You're just publishing messages. And it's very easy to, to scale this. How does a, an, an, an agent look like if I have to implement one? So um, this is a, like the simplest agent that just echoes the data back to you. Um, so you, you validate the input where you can say, I only, so uh, in this case, we have the Hello World agent um, with the uh, action echo. And I validate that I get a message that is a string. And then I just reply, um, reply with it. So very simple. And if I want to call it, there are two ways. Uh, the first one is via the command line. Um, so um, I'm collective RPC. So I'm calling the, the Hello World agent with the um, action echo. I give it a couple of arguments, and you can see like at the, at the top, it's first to determine how many agents are listening, how many are reachable, and it has a timeout of two seconds by default. So in this case, it found one uh, agent um, listening, and then um, it gather, gathers the responses, and at the end, I, I've printed out um, the, the actual output. Um, the, the other way how you would call it is out of Ruby. So um, this is, this is um, the, the, a very simple script, how you could call it uh, via Ruby. So you just require the mcollective and uh, define that I want to have the, the RPC client for Hello World and uh, call the echo action on it. So very simple. Um, nothing too fancy yet. So what, what, M -collect, what is great about mcollective is because it's using active MQ, you can use um, like broker um, possibilities like fan out and topic um, um, uh, topic broadcast to, def to find out who is listening to your message and who, who should respond. So um, in M Collective, those are facts and filters. So the idea is that uh, um, not all my agents are equal. Yeah? Some of those should be, should be um, application servers, a couple of others should be database servers, and then I have load balancers, I have um, caching servers, and, and uh, what have you. So um, I can have user-defined values, so those are usually classes which the agent loads on, on, uh, boot, uh, on booting. So you could have just a, a simple configuration file on every machine that tells you, you are a web server, you are a load balancer, you belong to project A, you belong to project B. And um, then you can filter by those. Another mean would be facts. So facts are things that the agent can introspect um, about the local system, like um, what packages are installed, what services are running, and so on. And the great thing is that you can extend, um, extend it via Chef and Ohai. So um, you can get information that Chef knows, like what packages are installed, in order to um, use those as fact filters in uh, in, in um, M Collective. So how would you, would you do this? Um, it's very simple. Again, via the command line, you just say, "I want to find all hosts that have a certain fact." So in this case, I'm, I'm not calling I'm not calling an agent, but I'm just um, finding what hosts are, are available. And I'm only filled, want to return those that have the fact um, country is UK. Just an arbitrary fact um, that um, if, if now no agent has it, nobody will respond to me. And the other thing, I'm testing for, for a class. I can do the same um, in code. So this is um, how I would um, do this in, in Ruby. How I would filter what kind of um, agents should be responding to me. So in this case, I'm only interested in dev servers and uh, only in servers that have the country flag set to UK. So this way, it's very easy to, um, to leverage the capabilities of a, of a broker to find out specific hosts. Like, I want to deploy to all my production machines that belong to project A. And uh, those are just filters. And M Collective uh, makes sure that it only calls the correct hosts. Um, 
So in our case, um, this is an example of um, the logic in, um, in the command um, application that calls Chef on, on, on a couple of machines. So um, we, we just have a client that we instantiate and then we call the, the actual RPC met method on the Chef act, um, uh, agent and uh, gather the responses and then return it. And of course, somebody has to introspect those and see um, did everything succeed or not. And uh, the, the other part is the, the agent running Chef uh, or calling out to Chef, um, which um, basically the most important part is, is just the call to Chef solo. Um, and the other part is extracting the JSON configuration file that you're giving it and uh, making sure that you can log it and, and so on. But um, the basic idea is I use, I, use this, the, um, I use M Collective to call out to Chef and I always give it um, a JSON config file, for example. And this way I can, I can scale it across hundreds of nodes. Um, so how do I can ensure security in such a setup? Um, if you have a lot of machines, if, you, if you're um, so big, of course security is a, is a big um, problem. How can I make sure that like, nobody can hack into my box and then control 1,000 of machines? Um, there are a couple of different means how you can do this in M Collective. Um, so the first is at the client level. Um, so of course the, the, um, the client has to co connect to ActiveMQ so you can have a, um, an ActiveMQ username and password. Um, probably more secure is um, using um, AAS and RSI plug uh, RSA plugins where you um, can encrypt and sign every message and then uh, every message and then the actual agents can verify those and say um, I have, this, I have a, um, um, the certificate of this user and I can verify that this message is authentic. Um, a simpler version would be just using SSL, which um, gives you the, um, the signing part, but not the encryption part. And of course, um, you can use SS, uh, TLS for all the communication um, with the broker. Um, on top of, uh, if you, on, on the broker side, you can have um, active MQ permissions to say what clients can, can, can talk to what topics and to what um, exchanges on the broker. So you can say that, um, you have different versions of your client and one can only talk to production machines and the other one can only talk to, um, to staging mas machines. And um, at the agent level, you have all everything that, because the agent is basically just another client, you have everything that the client can do. Um, plus you can have um, authorization, ACLs, and you can have um, auditing. So you can just um, have a very small plugin that uh, logs every command and who call, like what certificate, so basically what user called what command and log it somewhere. Um, those those uh, plugins are included by default. So it's very easy to, to have an auditable system where I can make sure only certain users can call certain machines um, that, that uh, I want to control. Um, how, do we, how do we scale such a setup? How do we um, make sure that, that ActiveMQ uh, or, or M Collective works on, on thousands of machines? Um, as I said, it's, it's not too um, difficult to do because you, you, the, your only problem is scaling um, ActiveMQ, which is a solved problem, probably not, uh, not always very nice, but it's, um, it's, you can have a, a network of brokers. So you can have, for example, per data center one broker, and then they talk to each other and relay, tra relay traffic. Um, you can have clusters, so um, that the client always like, tries to talk to multiple ones, and if one fails, it tries another one. Um, and you can, can have master-slave setups. So it's, it's not too difficult to, um, to have a very scalable and reliable infrastructure with ActiveMQ. Of course, in, in, in practice, it's always more complex than that, but um, at least there is, there, there is like um, an official and documented way how you can do this. Uh, but the, the nice thing is that um, ActiveMQ is very, very, um, very, very good at handling thousands of messages. So even if you have hundreds of machines, you don't need like 20 brokers or something. So um, what we did in, in this case was having like one broker per data center and then just one ag aggregation broker where you can like, then fan out to the individual uh, data centers. Um, yeah, so how do we handle the, the command and control part? This is um, probably the, the most individual part so that I don't have like too much to show but more a couple of, of general concepts if you, if you want so. Um, so the responsibility is, this is the place where, where I store the, the configuration, I store how should my clusters look like, how, um, um, what instances are part of, of, what, um, of what setup, and it, as I said, it interacts with the, the actual um, 
infrastructure provider. So it starts and stops your instances, it, um, it replaces failed ones, it allocates IP addresses and so on, which is um, probably the, 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 the easiest part and the, the boring part because it's just a couple of very simple uh, API calls. Um, more programmatic is handling recovery and presence, um, which you cannot do so nicely in, in M Collective. So M Collective, as I said, um, only queries uh, with every call what, what servers are responding. So it doesn't notice if, if an instance is failing. Um, and uh, so if you, if you configure it, I want to have 100 instances in this cluster, and you say, please deploy, and only uh, 99 are responding, M Collective doesn't care. And because it always does like an, an on-demand discovery, it, it will not notice that one is gone. So you have to implement some kind of a, a keep alive system, some kind of a, like a heartbeat this system where you notice um, like an event, like an agent disconnecting or something like that. And uh, this is very, um, so this is tricky to do, to do this right. Um, but the, the main responsibility is at the end to generate those configuration files for Chef. And, um, and depending on the role, depending on, on the configuration. And uh, this part is probably um, similar to all those, uh, to all cloud management software um, that, that are out there. And uh, this is the part where, where, like I say, most projects agree on. The, the custom part is, is at the lower uh, end, so user management, authorization, uh, like the business rule and processes, how should you restart things. So this is where it gets complicated in, in big companies. And uh, this is the main reason why they want to have uh, usually the, their own custom solution. Um, because they say we always, um, like before we deploy an application, we have to like go via those steps, um, like de deploy it first to QA, get, get like um, an acknowledgement from somewhere and so on. So it's uh, usually very complicated and usually very custom. Um, not very efficient, but um, th those are enterprises. Um, so this is the part where you have those, th this custom logic, like who should be allowed to do what, what uh, kind of functionality do we want to offer to what users. And uh, all the deployment recipes, of course, are, are usually very, very custom. Um, so if you, if you look at, at, a, um, at, at, for example, one, one um, configuration, how it could look like. So this is a very simple um, a JSON representation of a role, which is um, like the, the core concept of, of how do you want to um, how do you, you, you split your, your, your um, clusters? So in this case, we have a Rails application server um, role where we define multiple Chef recipes that should be running on different events. And uh, as I said, this is one drawback of Chef server that it doesn't know events. So you only have one global Chef run. But in this case, we have um, the, a setup event, a configure event, a deploy event, and uh, undeploy and shutdown, where, you where we can find granularity, uh, very granularly define what do we want to do on, on certain actions? And those would be the, the things that you configure for your different roles. So you would say, um, my database server should do those recipes on setup, and the other ones on deploy, and so on. And uh, of course, you can add what kind of instances should be running uh, in, this, in this configuration. Yeah, so in, um, in our case, the, the architecture um, looked like this. So we had a lot of. Um, so we had a very simple Rails app that is um, the, the endpoint for the user, either via API or um, via the web, which just as manipulates um, th this storage that I just showed you, this model um, of, of a role or of a cluster. Um, in, the, in our case, we store, a, we store it in, in Couchdb and Redis, but um, it's basically just a means to, to manipulate um, a model that you have of your system. And then you have, um, again, on, on the backend side, a lot of internal agents that um, then go out and call EC2, call VM, vSphere, call um, the, the actual agents on the system and push the, the, um, the configuration files downstream and uh, respond to the changes, update um, the model that you have in the database, and then the user sees, oh, deployment failed or whatever. Um, so, so in our case, all those internal agents are either also um, M collective agents or they could be just simple REST workers or something like that. Um, but, but the general idea is that, that you use, this, again, the, the message bus in order to, do, to publish and uh, to, to um, leverage all this, this work. Um, what, what did we, um, or, or what, what from, from our experiences, what works well and what doesn't work well in the system? Um, we made the experience that um, Chef is is probably a, is a great tool for doing configuration, 
but um, it's also very, very easy to, um, to, to write spaghetti recipes. Yeah? So it, it has a low learning curve, but it's very easy to um, get very complex, very, um, uh, very, very um, unreadable recipes. And especially in, in bigger uh, enterprises, um, the, the, uh, the, the idea of having to execute the configuration always and always again is, is not, very, um, not very appreciated. Um, so what we um, started to, to do is to go more and more into the packaging um, step. So to um, use Chef to only execute package managers, for example. Not for configuration, but for the, for the bootstrapping. Um, another thing is that, um, that, some, that, that Chef has some annoyances. And if we have a couple of minutes, I can probably talk about those two. Um, the, so one is uh, the... the um, that Chef is not really item potent, and the other is the, the two phases. Um, and what I, want, what I mean by write once and test everywhere is the idea is that you write one recipe, and then Chef executes it on thousands of machines, but it's, uh, the, the Chef run is, it is dependent on the local machine. So, for example, we had a case where, uh, like, one, once in, in, uh, like, one of ten servers will not compile PHP correctly. Nobody knows why. Yeah, it's just like some weird uh, case. And uh, the, the better solution is, of course, to have like a package version of PHP that you install somewhere. But, um, and, uh, but, but uh, then how do, where do we get this package from? So you have a chef script that then creates a package and so on. But um, the, the, it, it would be nicer to, to be able to, to have like a kind of a binary output out of chef run that you then only propagate to machines, which is also a lot easier to, um, to verify if if this machine has the, all the correct configuration and has been changed or altered by an intruder, for example. So this is something that the chef is missing. Um, from our perspective, M Collective worked out great as a tool. The only problem is, as I said, the, the missing um, presence and uh, event notification. So you have to have some kind of an internal agents that, that um, do keep alive checks and, and heartbeats and so on. Um, Nanite, which is uh, a different agent framework that uh, we also use, has those, but it has a couple of other problems that um, we can talk afterwards probably. And um, a, a very, a very nice uh, um, information or a very nice change in, in, in uh, M Collective is that the guy who wrote M Collective works now at Puppet Labs. Um, so there is going to be probably a, a much tighter integration with Puppet in the future um, with M Collective which means that M Collective probably will have built-in agents for doing the same thing that I just showed you to do with Chef, but where you don't have to re-implement it, where, um, where you can already just call out to Puppet. Um, yeah, so we have a couple of minutes, so are you interested in, in why Chef is not item potent and why two phases of Chef suck? Yeah? yeah. Um, okay, so... The first, the first, first annoyances of Chef is um, that Chef looks idempotent, but in reality it, it isn't. Or at least you, you could again say it's, it's a bug or it's a feature. So in this case we're looking at a directory um, resource of Chef that should create a directory for me. In this case I want to create uh, data logs and um, it should have the mode uh, 0644, it should belong to Mike and it should be of the group users. And if you don't have this directory on the file system, Chef will create it for you, exactly like you specified it. Um, what happens if, is if the directory already exists, Chef will say, oh, the directory is there, I will just uh, skip this step. At least what I would expect is that Chef will then see if the user and the mode and so on is correct or not. Um, but Chef doesn't. So, if, if, the, if you have like a server where the directory is already created and another one where the, server, where the directory is not existing, and at the end you expect the, the permissions to be the correct ones on both machines, um, you're wrong if you want to, yeah? So you, you could say, is it a bug or is, is it a bug in the directory thing? So there are a couple of other places where it's like this. Um, but especially if you have um, an undefined state of your machines beforehand, it um, can be tricky because you have to then to ensure that the permissions are correct and so on. Um, another thing with Chef is, um, so this, would, this one would be easy to fix, just to make sure that all the resources, also to make sure that all the, the sub-attributes um, will, will always be correct. The other one um, has more to do with how Chef itself works. So if, we have, if you have a, a more complex Chef recipe, 
like this one, I want to um, touch some file um, on Red Hat, and then I check, okay, if this file exists, I want to restart Apache. Um, does anybody who maybe has, has done something with Chef see a problem? Pardon? Um, so it, it will, the, the second part will never be executed, even if we are on the Red Hat machine. And um, the, the, uh, the reason is simple, is because Chef has two phases. Um, the first one is the compile phase. That, um, and this can be very annoying if you're playing first with Chef and you not understand why it's, why it's not working, because this is totally valid Ruby, right? And um, the problem is that it, it's not doing exactly what you expect. So the first, at first, Chef loads all your recipes and uh, compiles them to its in-memory representation of want, what you want to do and change on your system. And um, then it, it goes on and executes it. So the, the, the result of, of the execute method is not that the, um, the file is actually touched. It is that the in-memory representation of Chef would um, change to know that uh, it, and you want to execute um, some, uh, to touch some file on the file system. So when the, the if statement is executed, it's, it's not, um, it wasn't created yet. So at first it loads everything, and then it executes it all at once. Uh, of course in the same order and so on, but because of those two phases, you have to, um, to, um, to, use, to use a couple of other helpers. So you can, um, in this case, the correct solution would be to, to use the only if, there is an only if and a not if helper that um, do the check during the runtime and not during the compile time. Um, but, and uh, the other alter alternative would be to execute it right away. So during the compile phase to execute um, the resource. And uh, yeah, so this is very important to know if you're working with Chef, like nearly everybody runs at some point uh, against those, those two uh, bugs or features of Chef and it's very, <laughs> very annoying. Yeah, um, so I'm closing with uh, a couple of uh, bad remarks on Chef. Um, any questions? Yes, please. Um, yes, yeah, so, so um, we do this by um, out of the recipes to call out to, um, to, to different web services and to, to see if those are ready. So um, a typical thing is to, um, that you only want to restart your application service if the database server are accessible and are running. And um, we do this by um, also supplying information about the cluster state in, inside the configuration file that we put down. So an, an instance always knows what the state of the other instances are. And uh, then inside the recipes, you have a check that, um, for example, the, the, um, the restart recipe of the um, web server would then check, is, um, are there any database servers available or not? And if there aren't, it would fail, and uh, you would get the exception um, back uh, upstream where you can then introspect it. Or you can, of course, automatically handle it and retry after a couple of minutes or something like that. Um, yeah. So, so the question is, how do we bootstrap Chef on the, the yeah. machines? Um, so we, on EC2, we use um, the user data script for it. So on Amazon EC2, you can give um, machines arbitrary user data, so metadata if you want so. And inside this, we, we give it um, a simple shell script to install the, um, like the agent and Chef. And uh, what um, most Linux versions on, on EC2 will do when, when um, the init scripts detect that they are on EC2, they will check if there is um, this metadata available for this machine. And if it is, they will download it. And if it, um, if this, if it starts with a bin, a bin SH or a shebang, um, it will execute it. So this way, um, we, we bootstrap the machines on EC2. On, um, on the in-house systems with VMware, we had the agent um, like already on the images. But uh, with EC2, it's very simple uh, using the user data script. Any uh, uh, yes? So is it the, um, is it the, a lot of it is a replacement for Capistrano, or things that you could use instead of Capistrano? Is there kind of a use case where you say, well, we should still be using Capistrano, or is, is there some kind of cases where Capistrano is better, or uh, this kind of approach is, is a better approach? 
Um, so Capistrano is diff uh, definitely a, a much more simpler tool. So if you have only a, a, like a couple of servers um, that you don't like bootstrap on a daily basis, uh, Capistrano is, is, is uh, a lot simpler, a lot easier, and I would recommend using it. Um, if you have a lot of machines, uh, um, it's, it's not very easy to do this with, via Capistrano because Capistrano um, uses SSH, synchronous SSH connections, which means um, you cannot do a lot of those because usually firewalls will, will prevent you or, um, or network congestion, so you cannot do like 1,000 SSH connections, push a lot of data over it, and a lot, a lot not, not very fast and not like simultaneously if, if thousands of, of, of things should happen to, you, to your service. Um, so what we ended up doing is, is porting all things that we did with Capistrano to Chef Deploy. Um, the nice thing is that Chef Deploy also supports the callbacks of Capistrano, so everything that you can do like an after deploy, before update code, you, um, Chef supports the same uh, callbacks. Um, but you can still, um, because of the, the file system layout is compatible, um, um, for one, uh, I think one client, wrote, they wrote a simple gem that then takes this, this callbacks and export your cap file so that you, um, you could still use cap deploy from the command line, but you would um, use the same infrastructure underneath. And I think they're, they're, we, they were also thinking about writing a Capistrano plugin that actually only relays um, all the commands to, to M Collective. Yes? Uh, Chef Server has uh, responsible data bags. Yeah. Yeah, so um, Chef Server has data bags, which is basically arbitrary data that you can put in, that you can then use in your, um, in your recipes or cookbooks and access. And we do pretty much the same. So in the JSON representation where I store information to, to, for this role or for this cluster, um, I have like arbitrary JSON that I can put into too. And then we, of course, um, give it all. Yeah, so, so, um, so if, if you look at the architecture, so everything is basically stored in CouchDB. And then the agents look at, at the database and um, generate a JSON file, a JSON configuration on the fly and push it down. And it's, uh, it's, it's very, very easy, very fast. And, um, and this way you can, always, you can also, in the database, we store what systems um, do you have, what, con what representation should they have, what database do you have, and then generate the JSON and put it down to the instances. Yes. Um, yeah, so um, because you have now um, a central place where you can query all instances and, and store um, like monitoring data, for example. So um, we store a lot of monitoring and metering information in, in Redis and then have an agent that like um, every couple of minutes looks at, at this data and decides should I start and stop more instances. And it's very easy because you can, you can query the instances and then you can just start once and they will pop up uh, automatically, bootstrap via Chef and be available. Okay, so thank you very much.